this is going to be the best value gaming PC you can buy right now. We're going to be building a crazy powerful system from scratch. And it's not only something that's going to look absolutely incredible on your desk, but it's going to have all of the performance that you need for not only playing the latest AAA games, but also getting some serious work done with some coding. Because this video has been very proudly sponsored by the lovely guys over at Boolean that can teach you to become a software engineer in just six months. Boolean is an alternative to university that focuses on teaching you the practical skills that you need to actually succeed in industry. And unlike the three to four years and crazy high cost of university, Boolean can be completed via remote learning at home on a system like this. So if you're after an affordable system that is perfect for gaming and ideal for students, you're in the right place. Our build begins with the motherboard, and this is actually one of the cheapest ones I think I've used on the channel so far. It was provided by Gigabyte, and this is the B560M DS3H. And I don't think that its appearance is going to be any more interesting than the name, but don't let that put you off, because ultimately, for most people, I think you just want a motherboard to work. Don't get me wrong, there definitely are some compromises here. I don't think you can have the best temperatures on the VRMs at all, because as you can see, there's pretty much no heatsink there whatsoever. You're not going to have the absolute best port selection, but there's still enough, I think, for most people. However, you should definitely be aware that there actually isn't any Wi-Fi on this board. So if you need this, you're going to have to spend a little bit more money or buy an add-in card. So take your motherboard out of the box and then also grab the I.O. shield. Then gently place your motherboard on top of the box. The first bit of installation is actually with this, the CPU. It's an Intel build this time around and here we've got the i5-11400F. This is fantastic because it's got six cores but represents brilliant value for money. And this is pretty much the best gaming CPU for bang for buck right now if that's your priority. However, if you're going to do something a little bit more in depth I guess with your PC, maybe you're going to do some game development or anything that does actually require quite a bit more of a powerful CPU, then it's very easy to upgrade to the 11700F. This features two extra cores and it's around about 80 to 100 pounds more. This is what our CPU looks like. If you do go for an Intel one, then you won't have any pins on this. The pins are actually on the board. But if you do go for a Ryzen CPU, then it is the other way around. Either way, please be careful with both this and the motherboard socket. It is very straightforward to open this up. You just lift the lever so that the whole thing raises up. Line up this massive arrow with the one that's on the CPU. Drop that into place lower down the socket and then secure it home and you get some acrobatics while you're at it in a previous video i then went on to install this which is the stock cpu cooler that does actually keep this cool however it is loud and just generally not very pleasant and when you can pick up something like this for around about 20 30 pounds the hyper 2 on 2 evo v2 you're going to notice just how much quieter your system is everything is going to run cooler and hopefully last longer i appreciate that 30 pounds on a student budget is quite significant you're going to have to eat extra pasta for a bit longer it's funny because if you're watching this having already been to university or college or any sort of equivalent then you will know exactly what i'm talking about when you have like a couple of housemates and they have about three meals between them. I had a guy called Name Redacted and he had a grand total of two dishes. He would do pasta pesto with a little bit of bacon and fajitas and then he would leave all of the saucepans on the side for about a week to actually go mouldy. It was disgusting and we didn't really get on. Enough getting sidetracked, let's take this out of the box. Just a little bit more substantial than the stock cooler, don't you think? We grab our back plate, we lift up the motherboard and then we just feed this through. We then get these little posty things and we screw these into the board. Then you can grab these little metal brackets and place them on top. Then secure those in with the screws. Remove the fan from the heatsink. Grab your thermal compound out of the box called Master Gel Pro. Make a little line on the CPU. You'll notice that this is actually asymmetrical so that when you put the fan on, it's further away from your RAM. So make sure that you line this up so that it's leaning more to the left than to the right. And this is why I love tower CPU coolers because they're just so much quicker and easier to install than radiators. Like I do like all-in-ones, the performance is good and they look good, but they're all right, faff. Grab your fan again and then just gently place that on top. And then you'll notice you have a cable coming out the fan. You just plug this into the CPU fan port located at the top of the board, which in this instance is helpfully gray. With that out of the way, we can now move on to our other motherboard components. And I do appreciate that we've done this in a bit of a funny order. It doesn't matter with our exact build here today. Truth be told, I just got distracted talking about pasta. Sorry. So we're gonna move on to our RAM. And this is actually from Corsair. This is a Vengeance RGB SL. 
Hi, Future Marcus here. Sorry to interrupt the flow. As you can see, spoiler alert, we do get it working. Other than the fact that this Corsair RAM, for some reason, doesn't really like this motherboard. And as such, we have swapped over to some crucial ballistics RGB. We're going to open up these two grey slots, which are slots 2 and slots 4. And then these are two 8GB modules for a total of 16. And we're going to line these up with the grooves and then just push them gently into place. We're going to continue this theme when we move on to our storage. And here we're using a 500 gigabyte SSD. This is the crucial P2 and I've seen this for under 50 pounds at the moment. It is definitely not the fastest drive out there, but again, it's not really going to make a huge amount of difference. There is actually an exception to this rule though, because if you are going to study game development, don't forget that we've got direct storage just around the corner. So the people that are actually going to be using Gen 4 SSDs right now is probably going to be yourself. But grab your SSD and then gently place this in the port now underneath the cooler. This is why we should have done this first. And then very gently screw in our SSD. The only problem is that the SSD now looks as if it's upside down. Because I know I'm going to get bad comments, I'm going to move this down to the bottom just to appease you. Uh, no, PC-centric, what are you doing? You need to use the top slot because those are connected to the CPU lanes. This is the chipset one, it's gonna be slower. With that, I think it is now time to move on to our case. And this I purchased for around about 44 pounds, I think. This is the Matrix 40 from Deepcore. This is actually pretty similar to some of their other cases, but I think you guys are gonna like it because while it's definitely not the most uh, premium case out there, it's micro ATX and it's pretty much got everything we need, including plenty of airflow on the front. The side panels definitely leave a little bit to be desired. There aren't any cable management grommets and the fans are Molex, which is absolutely horrible. But as we discovered, Last time we built in a case similar to this, to be honest, they are quiet enough that it's not really the end of the world. And when you think you're buying a case for around about £40, well, you don't normally get good fans anyway. As long as they work and don't make a racket, we'll be fine. There is also airflow on the top as well. The only real thing to note is that you don't get two USB 3.0s, you get one, two, and one, three, which is a bit weird. First, remove all of the PCIe slot covers on the slots that you are going to use. So here I'm using one and two for the graphics card and then number four for our Wi-Fi card. Pick up that IO shield that we removed from the motherboard box earlier and then lay it in this very big hole at the back of the case. Then you can pick up the motherboard and now just gently line this up with the back of the case so that all of those ports poke through the IO shield. Then in this bag that you'll find at the back of the case, you'll have all of your screws and accessories. I say accessories, here we just have a bit of Chinese language. All of the screws, but then some cable ties. So I think accessory is a bit thin on the ground today. Use the round headed screws to secure this down into place. As the standoffs are already applied for us, it does make it a lot easier. When you're done, you will have something that looks like this. And you'll see that your gaming PC is actually starting to come along quite nicely. And I've just realized that I haven't taken a roll out of the freezer and I've got smoked salmon that needs using up. Three rolls, you're mad. The next step is gonna to be to plug all of these weird and wacky cables in. We've got our USB 3, we've got USB, we've got HD audio, HDD LED, power switch. And if you're wondering what all of these do, well, it's actually what makes the front panel work. So all of these do need to be connected to your motherboard. So route them through the hole that is nearest to the socket that you want to plug in. We'll grab our USB 3 and feed it at the top and then plug it just below these SATA ports. And these are what you'd want to use if you're using like a traditional two and a half inch SSD. We do also have that USB 2.0 and we're going to plug this right down at the bottom to these little white ports. HD audio is also white and it's all the way at the bottom left. And then these little tiny weenie ones that are for the buttons on the front. These connect to this little block at the bottom right and your motherboard manual will tell you exactly where to put them. We're certainly progressing very well, which means we can actually move on to our power supply now. And this is from Corsair, this is the TX650M. I think a 550 watt is probably gonna be the right sort of sweet spot for this build, but by going for 650, it does give us a little bit of expandability if you maybe wanna go for like a i9 CPU in the future, or go for an even more powerful graphics card. The TX is what we call a semi-modular power supply. So you save a bit of money because some of the cables are actually already attached to the power supply itself, but then they don't plug in the ones that you might use, 
depending on your exact configuration. So by removing these cables, these don't need to be in your system if you don't need them to be. We're going to need some for our graphics card. And then rather annoyingly, that Molex for the fans. As kids, all we eat is spaghetti oops. Turn your case around so that you can grab your power supply with the fan facing downwards and then just gently lower this into place. And it has fit successfully, which then means grabbing some hex screws out of our bag and then securing it into place. So you're then left with all of these cables that you need to plug in and it might look a little bit intimidating but it is actually very easy. The fans that are already pre-installed into our chassis use these things called the Molex connector. Then you have this very large ATX connector and this is to actually power the motherboard. You can push this through at the top. Below it you want to grab these PCIe connectors that will be used for the graphics card. And then finally you have the one that's labelled as CPU and this goes at the top right. That you can then bring through to now the top left and you can plug it in right at the top of the motherboard. It's probably quite obvious what you do with the very large one because there's an absolutely huge 24 pin on the right of the board. And then for most of you, this will be the very last component, the graphics card. So this is the Gigabyte RTX 3060. This is a two fan Eagle edition. It is definitely a little bit on the plasticky side, but this shouldn't matter at all because the card itself actually does still look very good. We do have a little bit of a pass through design as well because the raw PCB of this isn't actually that big. We have one single eight pin on the top and this is gonna let you do things like ray tracing or use DLSS. And because this is an RTX 3060 and not the TI, you do actually get 12 gigabytes of VRAM with this, which is going to be very useful in certain applications, but you just drop this in to the top slot, push this down into place, screw it in with one of those hex screws, grab your PCIe cables, and then just connect it to the top. However, for me, there is still one more component to install. This is our Wi-Fi card. And if you can get this for a good price, then this combination does make sense. Just be aware that if you do go for a Wi-Fi board, not all of them will have a high-end Wi-Fi chip in it. It would annoy you if you go for a cheap motherboard that has a cheap chip and then you only get like 80 down. Something like this, in theory, could get a gigabit per second. It says on the box 2400, but questionable. You just take it out the sleeve and then you line it up with the lowest slot. You can then just tighten it up, turn it around, grab this little cool magnetic antenna and then just plug it into the Wi-Fi card. And then here is our well and truly, hopefully working, finished PC. You can see with no cable management around the back, really not much to do here at all. This is a couple of minute job, maybe two or three cable ties. So on the whole, pretty quick and easy. Shall we see if this works? Because this is a system we're also going to use for software development, we are actually going to use two displays today. The one that I had in the studio already that I thought would be suitable is this, the HP Omen 25i. It's G-Sync compatible, so it is gonna be perfect for super fluid gaming, but the only thing that puts me off a bit with it is while the design is nice and the performance is good, it is a little bit more expensive than some of its competition. Which is why I got my wallet out and I bought this from Iyama. I think that's how you say it. On paper, this is a very similar monitor. It is also high refresh rate. This one, 165 Hertz IPS. So it's gonna have brilliant color. Something immediately obvious that is a lot better about this than the HP is that you can actually have this vertically, which might not sound that useful in a traditional gaming setting, but when you're doing software development, this is actually really useful when I see people do this all of the time. As we're building a full setup here, you're gonna need a few more things than just a couple of monitors. You're going to need some way of actually hearing your audio Audio. Here we've got the HS70 gaming headset from Corsair. You're going to want to grab yourself a decent mouse mass. It not only sets your desk, but of course means that when you are gaming, you've got a lot better traction. In terms of the mouse, I think this is the best bang for buck that I've ever really come across. It is an absolutely fantastic mouse that really doesn't feel too different to something that costs three, even four times the amount. This is the Logitech G203. And then finally, we have our keyboard. And trust me on this one, please don't buy a small keyboard if you are doing development. It is such a pain in the bum because you can actually set up a load of different presets, a load of different macros that will really help you. You'll soon notice that if you're missing keys and you have to do like function and then press something to actually get what you want to do to work, it's a right faff. I would honestly rather have a full size membrane keyboard than a smaller mechanical one. But obviously depending on your budget, hopefully you can get something that covers all of the bases. Okay, this is moment of truth time. Let's get this PC plugged in and powered on. Flick the switch 
and that's the reset button. We have RGB fans, ladies and gentlemen, that seem to be in sync, but I'm not sure how, because of course you can't control them. But otherwise, you can see it is a pretty decent looking system. It's not uh, anything that's too over the top, but I think it still looks nice. You've got a solid black case. It's mainly only the cooler that looks slightly out of place being silver, but you can get a black version if you have a little bit more money to spend. But otherwise, there you go, look. Works first time. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt that it's meant to do that. And indeed we have! We've made it! I think it's time to load some games and apps, don't you? Hello everyone! As you can see, we are all set up and ready to go. Things do look a little bit different to normal because we do have this dual monitor mount which makes it so much easier. As we mentioned earlier, we've got one of these displays in vertical orientation so you can actually see all of your code. And then on our left side, we have our horizontal one which is perfect if you're doing like a web application. What you're seeing here is a website that I did actually create myself. And yes, I have used a few add-ons. We're using Bootstrap here, but otherwise this is using PA HP. One of the hardest things to code in this website that probably seems pretty trivial when you're using them all the time is one of these image carousels to get this to actually be nice and smooth and to work on both mobile and desktop. It did take me quite a few days actually just for this one feature. Of course, if this all sounds a little bit new to you, then this is exactly why you should check out Boolean. Boolean is recruiting new students all the time. And the best thing about it is that you don't need any prior knowledge of coding to actually get started. Their full-time six-month course is way cheaper than university and it teaches you all of the skills that you need to get started in the industry. If you do want to learn a little bit more about Boolean and see how it can help you to learn to code, then you can take their free fundamentals camp where they'll actually go through the first few lessons completely free and you can find that with the link down below. But now is the time to jump into some games. This is Disney 2 right at the start of the game and if you are feeling a little bit bored of seeing the same sequence, well feel sorry for me because I've played this game around about three times on different platforms and I didn't actually swap over to Steam in time so all of my progress has gone. Which essentially means that I played all of that time for absolutely nothing other than a bit of fun, I guess. Rather than just spend another video moaning, let's talk about performance instead. And as you can see, with that frame rate at the top of anywhere between 120 and 150 FPS, even at the absolute highest settings at 1080p, you can have absolutely no trouble whatsoever playing this at super competitive settings, even if you are rocking something like this, which is of course a high refresh rate monitor. Next up, it's time for some Valorant, and I'm not taking any chances at all. I think it's fair to say that if you love high frame rates, you are going to love Valorant. This is a game that I do like, I'm not particularly good at, but it doesn't matter what sort of system you play this on really, even if you're running like very high-end integrated graphics, it's still something that you can get very high frame rates in. Here we're getting anywhere between around about 230 to 300 FPS, which is easily going to be more than anyone needs really, and yes, if you want to play proper eSports, then you're going to get like a 360 hertz monitor and probably like an i9 CPU or something like that, but realistically, for 99% of people, it's definitely not required at all. And the last, but certainly not least, we have my personal favorite, some Apex Legends. Here we are, dropping in, it is a hot drop on the drop ship. Haven't been on one of these in a while, actually. Interestingly enough, there was no one to contend with, so we can just focus on the performance. This is running at max settings, and we're getting around about 140 to 150 frames a second, but I really don't think you can have any issues with the performance of this at all. If you want to play pretty much any multiplayer title, clearly this is a brilliant PC to do it on. Let me know what you like, what you dislike, what you do a little bit differently, and of course, as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything in this setup, you can find four links down below with current pricing. Smash that like button, get yourself subscribed, and I'll see you in the next one.